Good afternoon and welcome. It's good, good to have a sunny day in Washington again as summer is, is on its way. Uh, I'm Roger Mark D'Souza, I direct our programs on global sustainability and resilience here at the Wilson Center. And we're glad that you're able to, to join us for a program that we're doing in conjunction with the Henry M. Jackson Foundation, looking towards building a resilient future through public service. And to kick us off today, I'd like to start by introducing um, the one of the vice presidents of the Henry M. Jackson Foundation, Craig Kennett. He's a partner, Davis Wright, Tremaine, and Alpine, and he focuses his practice in the fields of electric utility regulation. And I think before we get to Craig, I'm actually going to ask Lara Islin, who is executive director of the Henry M. Jackson Foundation, to give an opening a welcome and to introduce Craig. So, Lara, would you like to join us? <laughs> Thank you, Roger Mark, and, and welcome to everyone on this very beautiful Washington, D.C. day. It's always nice to be back here when it's not 95% humidity, so <laughs> we're, we're glad to come from Seattle to be here. So I'm, um, as Roger Mark said, I'm executive director of the Henry M. Jackson Foundation. We're based in Seattle, Washington. Uh, we were founded uh, over 30 years ago uh, at the death of Senator Henry M. Jackson, Scoop Jackson, kind of a towering figure in the international security and environmental fields, and he was a, uh, obviously a very esteemed public servant in his time. Um, the reason that we're back here this trip is that we have created a new uh, program. This is the inaugural year uh, of the Henry M. Jackson Leadership Fellows. And our idea in beginning the program was that we thought that Senator Jackson's values really transcended who he was as a man, and as we moved into an era where the people who knew him would no longer be active with the foundation, uh, to put it charitably. Uh, the, we, we thought we would look out to a new generation of uh, young people and new generations and to see whether or not the values that we thought Senator Jackson stood for could resonate uh, with uh, a, new, a new set of people and a new potential set of future leaders. And indeed, that's what we have found. We have a, a spectacular group of our inaugural class of Jackson Fellows uh, here with us today. I think we have seven of the eight. Um, but it's been um, a very heartening experience, a very inspiring experience to be able to uh, see the world through their eyes and see the learnings that they're doing, both about the values uh, that we're trying to impart uh, through the Jackson legacy and the kinds of networking and learnings that, that they're doing throughout the um, Northwest community. We wanted to both share some of uh, our fellowship uh, young people with you here today and give you a chance to talk to more of them at the reception that follows, and also have you hear from a couple of other really esteemed members of our um, community to see the kind of interaction, generational interaction, that can happen when you bring together uh, different leaders of, of, different, of different ages and, and sectors. So we're very excited to be here. And I'd like to introduce um, the Vice President of the Henry Jackson Foundation, Craig Gannett, who, as Roger Mark said, is an energy attorney out in Seattle and uh, one of the leaders of our foundation. So Craig. Thanks, Laura. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll just start off with a, a, a uh, the topic is obviously public service, and so before we move forward, I'm just going to give a very brief look backward and then a look forward with some random thoughts and suggestions that may or may not pique the interest of the panel as they proceed. Um, the look backward is to remind everyone that there was a time, believe it or not, in the not too distant past when public service was considered to be the highest calling. If you were really, really capable, you went into government service. If you weren't so capable, you merely made money. It came out of a British tradition, but it did make its way across the Atlantic, and it was part of the American culture for many, many decades. One aspect of that is that during that period, public service equaled government service. They were synonymous, something that uh, is no longer the case. 
which brings me to the, to the two changes that have occurred more recently, and it's a good news, bad news situation. First, the bad news. Public service is no longer considered the highest calling. I know that's shocking to many of you, but it's the case. Uh, the good news is that the definition of public service has dramatically broadened. And I'll touch on that in a moment. Um, it now includes far beyond government service. Um, and so I want to suggest a couple of strategies um, moving forward. Um, one is, with respect to government service, we need to make it, again, the highest calling. Um, we need to serve in government, and when we do, we need to share ideas in a civilized, respectful fashion. We need to respect the facts and call people out when they do not respect the facts. And where appropriate and where it moves us, we need to run for public office. Because we do, we do get the government we deserve, and if we shake our heads and, and tisk tisk get at pub public servants and elected officials, it's, it's a, we have no one to blame but ourselves. Um, the second thought is to make the highest and best use of the non-governmental space, whether that be NGOs or whether that be public service that has a, a excuse me, private sector work that has a public service component to it. Those lines are greatly blurred, and one can find a place along a very long spectrum that combines both the private sector and legitimate public service. Um, and I can su I'll suggest to you that in some ways there are advantages in doing public service from the private sector. It gives you a bit of independence, particularly if it's not your full-time work, if you're doing it as part of your larger day's work, it gives you a certain amount of independence, an ability to speak truth without worrying about the institution and, you know, or, the, or the work that you're doing. Um, it, it can be an adva advantageous um, uh, sort of a uh, base from which you do public service. Um, so three brief ideas going forward. One, um, exercise leadership. Personal relationships matter. I can't tell you how many times that I got a different reception when working on the Hill because I knew the person on the other end of the phone. But the only reason I got that different reception was because I'd already developed a relationship with them. Second, be intellectual entrepreneurs. Ideas matter. But in the cacophony in which we live, ideas tend to get lost. And the only way they don't get lost is if somebody makes them their own and, and communicates them you know, over a long period of time uh, as effectively as possible. And lastly, tell stories. We talked over lunch about how long a document most government officials will read, and the debate was over whether it could be two pages or 10 pages, or maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe 45 pages. And I submit that the length of the document <laughs> is overrated. <laughs> and how do I, what proof do I have that the length of the document is overrated? Next time you're on an airplane, walk down the aisle, look over the shoulders of the people sitting in the airplane, two-thirds of them are reading 800-page Stephen King novels. <laughs> and the reason they're reading those and not about important public policy issues is because most of us are not very effective storytellers. Mm. We live by stories. And if they won't read the documents, we need to put them in a fashion that's both factual and true and, and well-balanced, but, but that tells a story that, that brings people into that idea and makes them feel part of it. So with that, I'll um, turn it back over to Roger Mark. Wow. That's good. Thank you very much, Craig. That was excellent. I think um, uh, very compelling when we think of this idea of calling, capability, leadership, 
relationship building, intellectual integrity, but entrepreneurship. I was quite taken with that that pairing, be an intellectual entrepreneur and tell stories. So ready you I see you were making several of our panelists not in agreement and, and laugh. So thank you. That was excellent. I think what we specifically want to get out of today's session is a good informal dialogue. We're really looking for a good exchange of ideas and interaction with you and the panelists about questions around public service. What does that mean today? About leadership. Are leaders born or can they be nurtured? How do we look at leadership in this space? And what are the opportunities moving forward? So get a, to get a sense of this, we have designed this panel to hear from um, individuals who represent this idea of, of broader public service that Craig was talking about. But specifically, we want to also hear from the fellows. Um, so I chuckled a little as as um, Laura said as she was uh, Laura said as she was talking about the session that we wanted to have a generational interaction. <laughs> so we're going to aim for a little bit of that generational interaction. <laughs> Thank you very much, very much, Laura. But I, I want to start with the fellows first because part of what the Jackson Foundation is working to do through this leadership program is ready to give these um, emerging. Um, entrepreneurs and leaders an opportunity to present themselves and to talk about their work and what they're learning from their work. So we're going to ask the fellows to tell us a little bit about the fellowship program and their projects under the fellowship program and what they see this meaning for them in terms of leadership and public service. And as each of the fellows um, chats briefly about his or her work, we'll ask them to pose one or two questions to our colleagues and then we'll ask you to talk a little bit about your experiences and to also reflect on the projects that you hear them talking about but also to answer their questions. Does that, does that work? Does that sound okay? So we're going to start with our colleague at the end, um, Laura Stewart. Um, she is currently at the Oak Ridge Institute for Science and Education um, which is um, housed at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and has been working at community projects with various international organizations in Southern Africa, Canada, and now the United States. She's a steering committee member of the African American Leadership Forum, a member of various civic engagement boards, and part of the executive board of Swaziland's Environmental Law Center. So, Laura, I'm going to hand it over to you to kick us off. Thank you, Roger Mark. Um, great uh, introduction. <laughs> Um, so I, I just want to talk very briefly about the impetus for my project as part of the fellowship. So we joined the fellowship eight months ago and a large part of it is learning about leadership, learning about the senator's legacy, learning about civic engagement, um, learning about ourselves. But the other part of the commitment is developing a project that emulates the senator's values in leadership but also emulates our own. Um, and so. <clears throat> Excuse me. My project was a 18-minute docu video entitled "Our Story: Climate Justice and Environmental Justice." I'll just talk a little bit about the local and personal impetus for the project and and where we're at now. So, essentially, because the project was about climate justice, environmental justice, I had to come to terms with some data, um, and that data is that approximately 68% of African Americans live within the danger zone of coal-fired power plants. Uh, they breathe, breathe in, on average, 40% worse air than their white counterparts, suffer disproportionately high asthma rates, gentrification and land use, uh, housing prices push people of color into communities where, where the property values are 15% 15% lower. Uh, we're seeing higher instances of food deserts, so food access is a huge issue. On the national level, it means 40% of the U.S.'s uh, carbon emissions come from electricity production. 33% uh, of that comes from, you know, coal, burning coal, cars. Cars are a huge, uh, huge emitter of carbon dioxide. And yet what we're seeing is that 1% of the revenue, for example, from those industries goes to people of color. People of color are at the green ceiling, so 12%, I believe it is, of leadership positions in mainstream environmental organizations goes to people of color. And so 
personally as well what that means is coming from the kingdom of Swaziland in southern Africa it means that climate change or the impacts of climate change that are usually as a result of overconsumption are hardest felt in communities that are low income communities that do not uh, emit as much as mainstream communities it means that my own grandparents for example who have never owned a vehicle in their lives are currently in a state of emergency on their farm that they've lived on for years because of El Nino climate events. So what my project did is it asked uh, people in Seattle from various sectors to really take a hard look at their institutions, to take a hard look at themselves and how they approach the work of climate and environmental justice. And the product of that was an 18 minute video with 24 people from labor, environment, academic institutions, nonprofits, government, etc. And so we have 24 amazing advocates talking about the work that they're doing to move justice in these two sectors uh, with project support from the Henry M. Jackson Foundation, from Seattle 2030 District, and from the Bullet Foundation. We compiled what I think is an amazing video. It has over a thousand views on YouTube. It's been shared across various national forums. So I'll just end that with saying the contribution that that makes to public service is best sum summarized in this um, quote from one of our video participants who said, there is no more important work that we can do than to struggle together to solve inequality and climate change. Wow, thank you, Laura. So I, you know, you've packed a lot <laughs> into there. I'm notorious for Wow, that. <laughs> from you know, climate justice data, green ceiling, going from the kingdom of Swaziland to Seattle. Um, and, and I was quite intrigued, you said that for you being part of this fellowship and, and being part of this, this cohort of, of leaders working on these issues, that it was an opportunity for you to learn about yourself. And I wonder, because your project resonates on so many levels, it's, it's a really powerful story and narrative that you've pulled together. What have you learned about yourself in pulling this together? It's, it's really moving, compelling, pressing work that you've done under this fellowship. What have you learned about yourself um, and, and your ability to be a leader in this space? Thank you for that That's a tough question. It is very tough. Um, I think just off the bat, what I have learned is that regardless of the you know, institutional culture that we operate in, regardless of our, uh, maybe our previous capacities as leaders, regardless of our work experience, where you find yourself in, a, in your professional, personal career, that your voice matters, that if you have a passion for something, something that matters to you, that your voice is necessary and an important part of that conversation. So, Definitely coming to terms with being a self-advocate, but for sure coming to terms with what it means to value my own voice while asking other people to value what that means in, in greater processes. Um, so that's definitely been a, a great part of this fellowship for me is really developing the confidence, developing the self-advocacy to say, you know, my voice matters, my perspective on these issues matter. Um, and yeah, and I'm, I'm capacitated and capable of discussing these issues on various forums and with various audiences. Thank you. My voice matters. Very powerful. What, what's your question for our, our intergenerational dialogue? <laughs> what's your question for our colleagues who are joining us on the panel today? So staying somewhat in tune with um, my project, I think my question, and, 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 and in terms of public service as well, is what advice do you have or what is your experience in balancing uh, the public good with your with your own or, or how do you remain principled really how, how how are you remaining principled in the work that you are doing and how are you balancing your personal principles with whatever type of work you are you know tasked with doing at the moment wow all right they're taking notes they're reflecting thank you that's a great question so let's just go to our second colleague uh Tamara Power Drutis is the executive director at Crosscut Med uh, Public Media, Pacific Northwest's um, reader supported independent nonprofit electronic journal. So, reader supported independent nonprofit electronic journal. Wow. Yeah. 
She's a trustee of the World Affairs Council, previously served on the council's board of the Young Professionals International Network. She did that for five years. She's the former communications coordinator at the University of Washington Center on Reinventing Public Education. Wow. So, Tamara, what are your, your, tell us a little bit more about your project and your thoughts going into this, this program with the Jackson Foundation. Absolutely. Um, so thank you for including us in this panel and for everyone who's joining us today in the afternoon and for those of you who are joining us on the live stream. Um, uh, one of the things that Senator Jackson was, was well known for was creating a respectful and authentic place for dialogue. And that was one of the things that drew me into this fellowship opportunity rather than a lot of the other professional development opportunities that we have in the Northwest. Um, and he was able to look at policy from a place of bringing people in from different perspectives and different backgrounds to infuse their ideas into the policy. And he would then take the best of those and synthesize them into building a better product. So today I think that we're suffering from a lack of that approach. We have uh, bipartisanship becoming a dirty word. We have policy discussions happening in silos. Um, and we have a, a conversation that is predominantly um, hosted with one dominant voice. In the media industry, that voice is from white males. And so uh, as, as we look at applying Senator Jackson's principles to the media industry, the thing that really um, hit home for me in terms of my project was looking at how we can build a better news product by bringing in different perspectives and different voices into the media industry and into our product at Crosscut in particular. Um, in Seattle, 34% uh, of our population is communities of color, and that was from the last census, which, which is a little bit outdated now. But you wouldn't see that from reading our news, and you wouldn't see it from going to public meetings. There's, uh, there's a gap that exists locally, but I think that stretches across the country as well. The Media Insight Project recently did a study about the largest two minority groups in the United States, African Americans and Hispanics, and their um, perceptions of coverage of their communities in media, and they found that the, the majority of them felt that they weren't being accurately represented. A piece of that is that the coverage that does exist of communities of color um, in Seattle and in, in the United States is predominantly focused on crime or on equity rather than bringing them into the larger dialogue. And I don't see us solving that problem without actually integrating communities of color into the newsroom and having them pitch those stories, having them be involved in story discussions and adding their perspectives to how we should be covering stories or what stories we should be covering. So um, the project that I took part in as, as my Jackson Fellowship was to work with local newsrooms to find a, a basically host a one-day workshop and mentoring session with um, communities of color and ethnic community leadership in Seattle to bring them in to become storytellers and journalists themselves. Uh, we hosted this last, uh, last, this last Saturday and offered training on writing fundamentals, crafting a pitch, interview techniques, multimedia tools from photography, videography, um, and podcasting, as well as had um, editors from, uh, from Crosscut, as well as the South Seattle Emerald, Seattle Globalist, International Examiner, the Seattle Weekly, Seattle Channel, and KCTS 9 Cascade Public Media to meet one-on-one -on -one with participants to actually talk about pitches they might want to write about, what topics they're interested in, and give them some coaching and mentorship on how to break into the media scene. So um, the, the lucky thing for me was that as I went out and started talking with other newsrooms about this project, it was clear that we weren't the only ones thinking about it and that we weren't the only ones wanting to bring more voices into our coverage. So there was a lot of support for this and, and a great partnership and coalition that put the program on. Um, but the real test uh, for me will be in the coming months to see if we actually integrate um, those stories into our coverage and invite those writers to actually continue writing for our publications rather than just pitching one story and then moving on. So I think for me, the, the Jackson legacy that, that resonated with me around dialogue is, is not so much an option as much as an imperative right now. And I see media needs to take ownership of that um, and our role in it and begin to rectify the, the lack of diverse voices. Wow. I, when you were finished, the room was silent. <laughs> that was so powerful. Um, really sort of connecting this issue of voice, media representation, storytelling. And, you know, we have done a lot of work with journalists. And, and very often, even if you're able to get a, a journalist who will buy into covering these stories, they have to do the pitches. They have to do the convincing of the editors. So it's how do you get beyond those gatekeepers. What was most challenging for you in working on this project? Was it 
how were you able to identify who you were going to bring in to do the pitches? Was that the greatest challenge or was something else the greatest challenge for you in this project? Yeah, well, I think the interesting thing for me was that I, I imagined that the most difficult challenge would be getting newsrooms beyond Crosscut to buy into it. And it was it was a great uh, surprise to find uh, that, that we really weren't the only ones working on it. Um, and I think that's a little bit a... a commentary to the state of media as it is right now, we're much more open to innovation, much more open to trying different ways and much more open to collaboration. This kind of um, partnership across different newsrooms wouldn't have probably happened a decade ago, so uh, a perk of the um, <laughs> the decline of media. But um, I think the, the challenge uh, really is, um, or, or will continue to be, yeah, going out and finding um, those, those strong writers, the journalists of color that do exist, and finding ways to get them to write for our publications as well. There's often a commentary that, um, well, uh, people of color don't want to write op-eds or they don't want to write for, for journalism publications, and that's just entirely <laughs> untrue. Mm -hmm. um, we have phenomenal ethnic media in, in Seattle as well. We have great um, ethnic newspapers across the country, and so we have those writers out there, but we aren't necessarily bringing them into the mainstream coverage. Um, so, uh, again, talking about that kind of siloing of discussions, um, I think the part of the challenge for us is just um, is courting these people and, mm -hmm. and letting them know that we do want to change the nature of our newsroom and that this is a place that they can come and have an authentic voice rather than coming and feeling like they are going to be tokenized or going to be expected to be the one person of color that has to speak for all people of color in the newsroom, mm -hmm. which is what we hear from a lot, of, um, a lot of journalists of color is, I'm expected to represent everyone that doesn't look like you, <laughs> mm -hmm. which is a, is a difficult task. Yeah, fascinating. So what's your question for our panel? Um, well, I would love to hear how you are inviting input in your organizations. So how are you creating a space authentically for the communities that you're working with to add input or um, critiques or feedback into the initiatives or um, policies that you're working on in advance of actually deciding on what the policy is? And if there are any kind of lessons learned there for um, how we can take that back to our organizations and, and begin to work that dialogue into uh, more common practice. I think I'm glad I'm moderating the panel. <laughs> I don't have to answer these questions. Wow. Another great question. Thank you. That's wonderful. So Tom Brigette it currently serves in the government relations team for the Native Conservancy of Washington, where he builds coalitions across political and ideological lines with corporate leaders, elected officials, government agencies, and community organizations to affect natural resource policy and funding across political and ideological lines with corporate leaders, elected officials, government agencies, and community organizations. Wow. Prior to the Conservancy, he served as the State Policy Director for the Washington Wildlife and Recreation Coalition. So Tom, tell us a little bit about your experience with the fellowship and uh, your project. Thanks so much, Roger. Thanks so much, Roger, Mark, and uh, truly a pleasure to be with all of you today. Is this on? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, I, I can't tell you how much I hope it, it fills me with to have so many folks here in the audience, especially on a bright sunny afternoon, uh, uh, willing to talk about public service. I, I was initially drawn to uh, uh, the Senator Jackson Leadership Fellows, like I think you heard from the other panelists, uh, among a whole bunch of other different leadership programs that are out in the Pacific Northwest area. And there's several reasons for that. Uh, I truly found that uh, Senator Jackson embodied an approach that we desperately need in Washington State in talking about public policy and natural resource issues. Uh, he brought uh, servant leadership uh, really on the ground, looking at how could he approach with integrity and respect uh, communities who represented different viewpoints than he uh, himself or his staff necessarily brought to the table, and how could he have the diligence to really strive to seek understanding and represent those people uh, from all different walks of life uh, in all the public policy positions he took. And for me, as, as I looked out and, and where I wanted to go and enact change in Washington State, uh, I, I needed to learn more about that. And uh, so my project uh, along those lines is really looking out at, at the landscape in Washington and, and some of the many divides that we see, uh, urban and rural, uh, economic, you know, upper income and lower income, 
uh, uh, cities both sides of, of the Cascade Mountains, which bisect the state, and then, of course, the, the political uh, divides, which we hear so much about. And n no place in, in Washington does that really seem to touch down more than the issue of climate change. Uh, we've had, uh, uh, for several years, the community's been, been pushing, trying to build off of the good work uh, done at the national and international level, looking at what can we do in, in Washington state. And what we found in, in uh, conversations with community leaders, uh, in our polling, uh, in talking with elected officials, uh, we found that the, the issue of climate change in and of itself was maybe not the motivating factor that inspired people to action. What people were most concerned about is what they saw in their own backyard. Uh, they saw the impacts of drought, flooding, forest fires, sea level rise, uh, things that th they could see that it was not the same as it had necessarily always been. And uh, for me, looking at, at that landscape, we've done some truly phenomenal work with the coalition of partners around water. But in, in the fire, the forest fire space, it, there was a woeful lack of voices kind of unifying the community, and inspiring us to take action. And um, we've, in Washington, had several years of a truly devastating fire. Last summer, uh, we burned a, an, an area about the size of Rhode Island. The state, over the last two years, spent about a quarter of a billion dollars fighting uh, these fires. And this is in the face of mental health, mental health crises, homeless crises, places where we also desperately needed to spend money. And so we have a window of opportunity in Washington to really marry the conversation around climate change and the conversation around some of the impacts on the ground, namely forest fires. So I personally have uh, worked uh, trying to, to learn from the senator's values of uh, reaching out, understanding uh, where different communities are coming from. I seek to uh, uh, truly understand and help uh, unlock uh, community voices around the state to come up with a cohesive, consistent narrative and plan of policy action to try to fix these problems on the ground. And uh, this involves working with everyone from local governments, uh, the forest product sector, uh, communities of color, uh, especially Latino, Latina communities that have been uh, predominantly impacted by uh, uh, fires and smoke, uh, working with local agencies and local governments to try to figure out how can we put together a plan of action that, that begins to move the needle and also drives for uh, greater action to address climate change. So it's, for me, been a humbling project. I, I've been blown away by both the enthusiasm I've been met with from communities around the state, but also the recognition of really how much more there is to learn. Uh, I uh, am constantly, uh, constantly humbled by the expertise that others are bringing to the table. And what I can do in my small part to help unlock that for, for action is you know, what keeps me going. So pleasure to be with you all today, and uh, thanks so much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Tom. It, you know, it's, it's really interesting to me as I listen to, to you, Laura, and, to, and, and to Tamara. You, you all speak about voice. You know, my voice, their voice, the community voice. Very, very interesting, very compelling. And then your reminder of about, you know, we talk about climate change, but to what degree are we really communicating? How do we get to people's motivation and reach people where they are? I was, I was um, intrigued because as you started speaking, you gave three keywords and you talked about integrity, respect, and diligence. You know, in terms of the senator's legacy and wanting to learn from that. And, and you talked about how humbling it was to work on this project. And I wanted to ask you, as, so you are at the end of your fellowship now, is that correct? Yes. As you reflect black, back at when you started your fellowship, what did you learn about yourself that you didn't know before? And you said, wow, boy, if I didn't do this fellowship, I wouldn't have learned that. And that is really important as I think about a career and about being a leader and sort of thinking about public service. Any? Thank you, Francesco. I now have a better mic. Excellent. Ah, there you go. <laughs> so. yeah, good. Uh, beware, everyone in the audience. <laughs> uh, a great crash question, Roger Mark. Um, for me, I think one of the things that's been most striking o over the course of these last few months is simultaneously a recognition of some of the inherent power 
uh, that my race, my gender, my economic position, uh, my geographic position afford me, uh, and also the responsibility, the obligation that I have to help uh, uh, unlock other voices who may not feel as empowered within either the political process or the, uh, uh, the community dialogue. Um, I, I think a lot about working with folks uh, primarily in smaller communities or with smaller organizations who may not have government relations professionals on staff. They may not even have an organization that has full-time staff. And yet they're feeling uh, disproportionately the effects of of fire or of flooding. Uh, they struggle to get uh, public dollars to land in places where it would make a great difference. And in some ways, for me, it's been a process of learning how best to use uh, uh, responsibly the, the privileges that I have to help others really enact the change they need to have and not go in with an expectation of what that might be. So I, I talked a bit about how humbling this process was. So much of that was learning to check my expectations, my ego, my public policy prescriptions at the door and learn from others about what really needs to be done, what would make the greatest difference in the community, and how can I serve, uh, and how can I, how can I help provide the tools that others need to enact the change that they want to see. Wonderful, great. So this is being recorded, by the way. So <laughs> I hope 10 years from now you look back and say, okay, you know, but excellent. Hold myself accountable. Hold yourself accountable. Hold all of us accountable. Thank you. That was wonderful. So I'd like to go to um, getting your question. What, do you have a question for our fellow panelists? I do, and I, th I think it's building on a theme you might have heard from uh, the others. Uh, I, I wanted to ask my fellow panelists, uh, as you look at the landscape of partnerships and communities that you work with. Uh, one of the things you've heard a lot from us is there are communities that are, are less well represented, either within the political dialogue or within the NGO community, NGO leadership. Uh, where should we, as we come into our careers, where should we pay extra close attention? Which organizations, which communities, which people should we make sure to include uh, as we as we uh, step into leadership roles. Excellent. Thank you so very much. So we're going to move next to, to um, our colleagues who are here to give us a little bit of their perspective. We're going to start with Lindsay Coates, who is the president of Interaction. And she also serves on the steering committee of the World Bank Global Partnership for Social Accountability, the executive committee for modernizing foreign assistance network, and the boards of Episcopal Relief and Development and U.S. Global Leadership Coalition. Before joining Interaction, she was the Chief Operating Officer of PAI, Population Action International. So, Lindsay, um, I'm going to ask you if you could start by telling us a story of, of how something that was really significant to you in your career, it could have been a turning point or something, that, a touchstone that really resonates with you in your career. And I'll also remind you and, and the other panelists of the three questions mm -hmm. that our colleagues have posed for you. How do you remain principled? How do you remain true to yourself? How do you get input from the communities you serve? And if you think about partnerships and communities that have been less represented, where should we pay, where should we be paying extra close attention? So Welcome. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Briefly, Interaction is a coalition of about 200 NGOs that work on issues of poverty and justice outside the U.S. Our organizations are faith-based and secular. Uh, they include the big names you know, like World Vision, and tiny organizations like the, uh, the Buddhist Lao Chu's uh, Foundation, which has no paid employees. So it's an extremely diverse group of agencies that are working on issues of social good. Um, I'm going to do a, try to do a brief and pithy story. Uh, about 20 years ago, 
um, I was leaving my practice of civil rights law in Mississippi to come to Washington, D.C. And I had the great good fortune to have as a, a mentor and friend a former governor of Mississippi who was also a friend of Bill Clinton. And of course, at that time in the late 90s, everybody in Washington wanted to be a friend of Bill Clinton. So I diligently used my connections that Governor Winter gave me in terms of meeting with people who might be working in the civil rights area area because that's what I thought I wanted to do. I thought I wanted to stay in civil rights. I had a vague sort of discontent with my litigation practice and I realize now in retrospect it was because a lot of that is back backward looking and not forward looking. And so I was really interested and open to sort of new ways of working. When I think about my whole career, I think it's so important to understand your vocation, what drives you, and I would commend all three of you for having a very deep sense of that at a very early age. I'm not sure that I had that strong a sense of vocation. But if you have it and you know what it is, it needs to permeate everything you do. And this relates to uh, my experience of, of 20 years ago. I know I've always had a passion for issues of justice and voice and inclusion. If I look at every job I've done, that fits. So I had an interview with a person who I'd had to hound relentlessly via the fax machine and <laughs> other, <laughs> other ancient technologies to meet with me. And I finally got into his office late one afternoon, the Office for Civil Rights, um, and, and he was very rushed. He barely had time to see me. I handed in my paper resume. I had maybe 15 minutes, I was told. It turned into 30. But the thing that I did without knowing it that made the difference was as I walked out of his office, I noticed a framed family picture. And we've all seen these in people's offices. It's the spouse and the, and the babies. And what was striking about this picture in 1998 was this was a white man, picture of a white male spouse, and two little black children. And I picked the picture up and I looked at it and I said, is this your family? How lovely they are. And, and I didn't, it wasn't like a conscious manipulative thing. It was just so moving to me to see that because to me that was a picture of justice and inclusion and people wanting to live their lives. And he told me later that he went from that meeting to speak with his boss and said, I found our chief of staff. <laughs> so the littlest thing you do as long as it comes from a place of authenticity can make a huge difference because the difference it made for me was I found that I had an aptitude and interest in organizing people and in being a chief of staff and in building a coalition and in working with others and that led to a job of chief of staff at OCR which was a job that Anita Hill had actually held uh, at an earlier stage in her career so which was a much more prestigious job than I ever expected to get in Washington so I think that idea of sort of being open to what happens and operating out of that place of authenticity is tremendously powerful so I would say it's it's like finding the vocation and theme for your work what is it that you do and that relates to that issue of a voice and balancing you know, that the authentic authenticity and t theme and what is important to you, what are your values, and really living that out day to day is going to serve you so well, even though there'll be times when you think, I'm never going to find a job or it's never going to work out, but having that space. Mm -hmm. And then finding the, the space of what seems easy to you. We tend not to value the things that we do for ourselves that seem easy. We tend to think that they're really, you know, we devalue the skills that we're good at. So I'm good at managing relationships. I'm good at managing institutional relationships. I didn't value it till someone else said, oh, you're really good at that. So, so finding those things that you do easily, because it's a long, hard slog. Social justice work is a long, hard slog. And you need to be getting up excited about the tasks and what it is that you're doing. Uh, and then being open to the serendip. You can't map it all out. You can't. You will, you will have an encounter with someone and something will tip and you won't know it till later on. So just being open to that. So I'm trying to make sure I answer these excellent questions. Um, 
valuing your own voice. I think I've answered, answered that, your vocation and authenticity. Um, the space for feedback is, is really critical. My organization is a coalition that that's what we do. We do inclusion of civil society. And like, I could give you books we've written <laughs> about this topic. I would love that. <laughs> I will, I, we will talk, we will talk. But I think that that, um, that uh, uh, also the other, other piece of that is being highly self-critical about, about am I really doing everything? Am I, am I really truly being inclusive? You know, one of the things we found, for example, was um, our civil society handbook has this thing about, about making sure you schedule meetings at times and when pl in places where working women can get to them. You know, really simple, how you arrange the room. You know, really simple things that are really important for including people. Um, and I think that gets to who, how should we be inclusive? I hope I've sort of answered everything. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I agree in a very, very compelling story. That was wonderful. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, so let's go to Andrew Dirtz, who is the Director of International Government Relations at the Nature Conservancy. And prior to joining the Conservancy, he served as a Special Advisor for Global Policy at the International Union for Conservation of Nature, IUCN. Um, he additionally served as IUCN's uh, uh, Canada office um, leading responsibility for political constituency and fundraising relations in Canada. And he was also the lead forest negotiator for the U.S. Department of State and served as the forest policy advisor to the World Bank. So, Andrew, what are, what are your thoughts? What's your story and your reactions to the questions? Well, thanks, Roger Mark. Um, I think this is a lot harder assignment than you led me to believe after <laughs> listening to these <laughs> So let me tell a couple of quick stories to get at a point. Um, so much of what I do in my career now is about coalition building because of a recognition that group, individual, or oh, microphone, um, group, individual, or institution actually has the answer and can solve any given problem on its own. And that's actually a, a change in mentality from when I started out in my career 20 years ago. So as one example, 20 years ago, when you went to the World Bank, the world, and I don't mean to pick on them because it's a great institution, they had an attitude that they were the single largest provider of development capital to the developing world, and they had the political relations with the ministries of finance, and they had the answers, thank you very much. They are no longer the larger pro largest provider of capital to developing countries. Um, they were overtaken by the major uh, Western development banks in the 90s, and these days they're actually overtaken by developing countries' financial institutions, whether it's the China Development Bank, Development Bank of South Africa, or BNDES in Brazil. So they're trying to figure out what's our value added in this world, and the answer is the intellectual capital rather than the financial capital that they bring, and their ability to form partnerships to help solve big global challenges like climate change, food security, and water availability. So the key point in that is that you need these days to figure out, the, or probably the most important career advice I can give is developing the soft skills to build partnerships and relationships and coalitions to help solve these problems because no one institution can do it on its own. Two quick stories from my own career um, that helped to illustrate that. So one is I, I did a brief spent stint as a mercenary diplomat at the State Department. The lead forest negotiator for the State Department took a leave of absence to go teach for a year, and I got brought in to play the role, which was a heck of a lot of fun. Um, I couldn't sit behind a, state, a desk at the State Department until my security clearance had come through. But there was no problem with me going and sitting behind the United States flag in the United Nations and, be, and negotiating on behalf of the United <laughs> States government. That was not a security threat. <laughs> But one of the funnier moments in those in the negotiations of the UN Forum on Forests was we were negotiating a description of the impacts of deforestation. So I looked at my colleague, who was the, 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 my lead counterpart from USAID, and I said, well, there's nothing in there about biodiversity, so we'd better say that one of the negative consequences of deforestation is that it negatively impacts biodiversity. He, right? He agreed with me, so I raised the U.S. flag and I inserted some language about negative impacts on biodiversity. And the Swiss delegate turned around and gave me the dirtiest look. <laughs> so the U.S. doesn't do that. 
And then the woman from the European Union tapped me on the shoulder and said, that was a brilliant Machiavellian move. <laughs> By defining it about biodiversity, you've prevented us from defining it about climate change. Well done. I'm going to get you back for that. <laughs> now, I worked for the World Conservation Union. And my colleague from AID had used to work for the World Resources Institute. We actually believed that. <laughs> the point there is, if you get behind the stereotypes of the nefarious US negotiating team, we were not up to no good. We were actually completely legitimate and sincere in a very simplistic statement. But there's always this assumption that well, it's the US, they must be up to something. Or any other government for that sake, they must be up to something. Look beyond the stereotypes, especially if you want to build those coalitions and partnerships. The other quick story in that regard, about a year ago, I was in Beijing working on climate issues in the lead up to the Paris negotiations. And you know there was a lot going on between the US and China as the world's two biggest emitters. We had just signed a bilateral agreement, or not agreement, but a, sort of a, a partnership evolving with the US and China, both announcing their, at the time, intended nationally determined contributions, right? Their pledges for Paris. And it was really the heart of climate diplomacy. And I wound up going out to dinner one night with a woman who was the person holding the pen writing China's national climate change policy. And I was with two of my Nature Conservancy colleagues, one who was also a former State Department climate negotiator, and one who was the former Deputy Secretary of Interior, experienced government professionals. It was a great conversation about people from both the US and Chinese governments complaining about how difficult it is to get the right thing done because of the stupid bureaucracy and the stupid politicians who wouldn't get out of the way. Now, the fact that these were the Americans and the Chinese didn't matter. These were well-intentioned, hardworking people, and it was a very human moment about the challenges of trying to do the right thing because of the bureaucracy, and it could have been any governments in the world represented around the table. And as frustrating as it was to move climate policy in the US and China, it actually gave me great hope that we actually can make progress on these issues. Because at the end of the day, there are an awful lot of hardworking people of goodwill trying to do the right thing through these institutions. But what matters is getting past the stereotypes and really getting to know the people. And then, as I say, from a career development standpoint, bringing the soft skills around relationship management and around coalition and partnership building to get things done. Because the goodwill is there if we can figure out how to mobilize it in the right direction. Thanks. Amazing. Another, another very compelling set of stories. Thank you. So um, we're going to go last chair. Uh, Ted Adams, Program Specialist of Volunteering and National Service at, at the Peace Corps. Uh, he manages the team's volunteer partnership portfolio, supporting ongoing Peace Corps efforts to collaborate with organizations and institutions that leverage volunteer service to build stronger communities around the world. And this is what was I was particularly interested in, because we, we, we know the Peace Corps, but Ted's work is building uh, above and beyond these opportunities to volunteer overseas how do you build this by bringing others I think exactly the point um, th that you were making prior to this uh, Ted served as a director of marketing and communications at the Association of Small Foundations and he also worked for rare a nonprofit organization focused on environmental conservation so Ted what are some of your stories and thoughts perspectives from your career your work and, and the Peace Corps sure well thanks um, it's great to be here I I was this has happened to me last time here. I'm scribbling notes all over the place because there's so many fascinating <laughs> things going on, conversation threads. So I think what I'll talk to you about briefly is just, so I spent my, my career, you know, the past 20 years in volunteer, in the volunteer sector. And I think, I guess I kind of think of volunteer service as kind of the gateway drug to public service, <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> Some of us stayed in the, stayed in the volunteer service spe um, sphere, but I think I, I think people will look back at this time or in the last 20 years as really kind of a, a renaissance or a golden age for volunteering in our country, just taking some great ideas and really, really innovating them. Um, the creation of a, a national service, the Corporation for National Service, and a whole network of um, ways to, to, to elevate the best volunteer, volunteer engaging organizations we have, like the Habitat for Humanities and, and figuring out how to get more reach. And, and I think that that's, I, I, was, I came along at just the right time, so I think of some of these questions, I think in my own trajectory, 
um, some of the questions you had were about how do you stay principled and how do you engage these folks and I think the thing that got me hooked you know I think I, it, your service hooked me and kind of never let go so I think uh, that's a big part about if we can figure out that secret sauce in terms of engaging more people in, in public service that's the key and for me it was an alternative spring break something as simple <laughs> you know it met me where I was at at the right time I stumbled upon a, an alternative spring break where we built houses for a week and in, in Memphis and I stayed best friends with the, the 15 people there for the rest of my two years we went we did other service work leadership on campus I, I left there um, I left there and went to work for um, the Corporation for National and Community Service and I think the next the next thing I thought of in these comments is it's important to in terms of staying principled it's staying close to that work um, and and doing doing the homework and being obviously you guys are doing your homework but I think be, by being at the Corporation for National Service at that time it was highlighting the best of the volunteer engaging organizations but it was also like this incubator for new ideas and social entrepreneurs were coming to the table thinking about how can we take this service model this history of service and and really um, you know accelerate it the city years of the world the teach for Americas um, the youth builds and and I think that allowed me to that knowledge of, of uh, working knowledge of the sector and and having that support and that system in place allowed me to take a risk when this entrepreneur stopped by one day who talked about building playgrounds kind of like a habitat for humanity around the country and he was running a nonprofit out of the back of a deli in, in um, Adams Morgan they had no money they had a couple shovels and <laughs> and he wanted me to come work for him and I did for three months without pay but he secured we secured what that we thought would be two or three partnerships uh, playground builds but it turned out to be 37 so we turned into a national nonprofit overnight but I'm just saying that that you know a knowledge of the space and being around people who have these ideas um, really created a huge opportunity for me and I think finally it's staying close to the work um, maybe some people would start in the field as a volunteer and then and then work their way up to larger organizations and that's kind of the natural trajectory and I am um, went back to the fields I have gone back to the field several times <laughs> um, after helping grow kaboom for three and a half years I went to serve as a Peace Corps volunteer and I think that's made a huge difference for me is just trying to stay as close to that work um, being um, humble <laughs> and humbled uh, talking about going door to door in communities talking about the importance of good hygiene and health when I myself was filled with parasites and looked like a very sickly person and people telling me to <laughs> come back when you feel better um, tell me about health and taking care of myself so those are kind of my personal experiences with it and hopefully we can address some of these other things in the conversation Thank you very much, uh, Ted. I had a, a friend of mine who moved to uh, D.C. From, from Ohio, and he said, gosh, there's this one organization that I really want to work with, Kaboom. <laughs> that was his sort of the best place to work. work. So right. let's open it up, up to you. We want to make sure that you have an opportunity to engage the panel also. We hope you'll have questions for our colleagues, all, all the panelists, but we'll, we'll borrow the microphone here again. So we'll have um, colleagues coming around. You raise your hand, give your, give your name and affiliation, and if you can get quickly to your question, so we can get many questions, and also remember that we have an opportunity for lots of networking afterwards as we have a reception afterwards. So yes, please, let's start with, with you here. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Mariela Medina, and I'm a Payne Fellow uh, with USAID. And uh, one of the key concepts I think I take away from your talk was uh, in finding your vocation and like the service hook you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, which I think is very important for public service. And uh, part of that is just being exposed to those opportunities that um, show your vocation or get you hooked on service. And my question is, uh, do your organizations, are they taking any initiative to kind of outreach to communities um, to just have that initial exposure for um, people? Great, thank you. Yes. Any other questions? Yes, please, up front here. 
I am Matthew Kerm. I'm with the Seattle 2030 district. I'm also a Henry M. Jackson fellow. Uh, so Craig talked about at the beginning uh, the power of storytelling. And uh, I'm wondering what story you would tell to bring people to public service, kind of based on that. If your organizations are going out and doing that outreach, what's the story that you tell them that grips them into that to make a difference? Excellent. Yes. Any, any other questions? Okay, so I, I have a couple additional questions that I'd like, like to ask you. I'd, I'd like to ask the Jackson Foundation fellows who are on the panel um, to, if, if there was one thing that you could ask our fellow panelists to do better. So you're standing from your position of you know your early mid career, you're thinking about this sector. What do you wish we and I you know I include myself in this? What do you wish we had done better in laying the foundation for you? What do you look at mm -hmm. and say, really? What were you guys thinking? <laughs> or how could you let that happen? Or were you asleep at the job? Really? Come on, guys. You know, I'd like some of your thoughts thoughts on that. And for my other uh, fellow panelists, I'd like you to just reflect back on your career. What do you know now that you wish you knew when you started your career? It's like, you know, man, if I knew that at the beginning, I would have made so much more progress. So I'm going to throw those in to the two questions. So there's a question about what um, opportunities are you providing for folks to be exposed to vocations and, and have a sense of what the realm of possibilities are so that they can become passionate? And what story do you, are you telling to bring people to public service? So um, how about we start with you and then go this way. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, one thing in terms of reaching out, um, it's been a really fascinating process to see Peace Corps. Peace Corps just rebranded. We just had an, just launched a new logo and a new look, and um, you can check it out on our website. <laughs> but along, but that what inspired that was taking a hard look at who, what what the field was doing, who was volunteering, who wasn't volunteering, and what did Peace Corps need to do to kind of position itself right in in a very noisy world uh, with lots of opportunities. And, you know, the millennials, millennials are a large target audience. And I think one of the things we've shifted to do is talk more, well, give more choice, first of all, um, more opportunities, different ways to serve. Um, people can actually apply now directly to countries for the first mm -hmm. time in the history of Peace Corps. They can, um, they ap can apply first before going through the, the um, reams and reams of application process, which gets applications completed sooner. Um, but... It also talks a lot more about what volunteers do. A lot of people knew that Peace Corps still existed, but they didn't know really what volunteers were doing in the field. So if you, you'll, just, you'll see it in one second going out to our site. It's all about stories. It's all about what volunteers are doing day to day and um, what it looks like. And it really kind of tried to leverage Peace Corps' assets of, of photos of uh, people doing a lot of writing and journaling about that. Um, that's one thing. Maybe I'll come back to okay. the other questions. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you need that mic back. Yeah, or can you, if you can share a mic, that would be great. That one's way better. All right, let's try that. There we go. Uh, so I'll also just tackle the first question. We can come back. Uh, and it'll be interesting, Andrew, to hear your perspective from the international level as opposed to my very Washington state focused. Certainly at, at the state level, we put a lot of time thinking into who is not at the table. Um, and, and that's everything from our staffing, trying to make sure that we have uh, a staff that rep represents the population we work with uh, and we should be working with, a board of directors or local trustees. We try to put together advisory groups as well that make up um, uh, the various communities in which we work. We have a very robust um, public volunteering program to try to help uh, introduce people who are not familiar with the conservancy or just conservation in general, how uh, kind of uh, the gateway drug of, of conservation, get folks in the door. Uh, and then personally for me, my, my work is all about, as I talked about before, how can I help um, empower voices who are not part of the uh, political discourse and give them the tools they need uh, to be successful in that space. So uh, all across the board, but 
very much uh, we are constantly critical, asking ourselves, what can we be doing better to make sure that you know, we're not monolithic in our thinking uh, and who's around the table? And in, in, in any questions for us in terms of what you think? How did we screw up? Yeah, how did <laughs> we, I, I was trying to be a little bit more. Lindsay uh, said it. How did we screw up? You, you want a question or a oh, or yeah. comment or yeah, asking so why? Or how, how did we screw up for you guys? Yeah, maybe one, one thing to uh, – the one of the questions I was originally going to ask today uh, was what gives you hope? And part of the reason I wanted to ask that question is we, we've had the privilege over this fellowship of meeting with incredible leaders across the board, uh, uh, folks working for the Gates Foundation, uh, folks who are you know, leading in, in government and in, in nonprofit service, uh, and of course, you know, the time we're spending here. And one of the things that's really surprised me is the comment that comes up again and again, which says, Oh, th that particular issue, you know, pick your issue, climate change, women's rights, uh, poverty, across the board. Our generation failed on that one. Uh, hopefully your generation can fix it. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask about hope in part because uh, you all continue to be in positions of influence and you work with a lot of people who have influence. What can we maybe solve now that our generation doesn't need to work on and you know I'm happy to pick up all, all the next stuff but uh, <laughs> talk, talk a little bit about where, where you see hope for, for the next few years. Thank you. I, I'm so loose with my language because I have young adult da daughters who don't <laughs> hesitate to tell me you know where, where we could all be doing better. Um, I, I, on the question of initial exposure and outreach um, Interaction hosts something called the Young Professionals Network, which is targeted at people who are interested in the NGO se sector and, and wanting to engage there. Um, we also, uh, at our forum, we have scholarships for um, visitors who come from, particularly for people who come from outside of the U.S. to participate. We're very careful in terms <coughs> of our workshops and panels and sessions to be very inclusive of voices from outside the U.S. Um, m our members work in every country and in, in every sector, uh, but there's there can be a sort of a little inside the beltway conversation about how we're all going to go out and fix poverty for other people, which is not a useful way to have the conversation. Um, the, the question about um, the story uh, to bring people to public service is a really interesting one. I, I have found actually that that the reality for most of our agencies and most of our members is we are oversubscribed in terms of the people who want to engage. Mm. Um, and I, I, I think about when we get applications for jobs, we get many more qualified candidates um, than we have slots for. So I don't feel a pressing problem. That said, I have to rebut my cynical friends of my own age who are like, well, why are you even bothering to be in Washington? And, and you know, it's just a cesspool and it's just a waste. And, you know, my feeling is we can't let the bad guys win. It's that simple. We cannot do that. We cannot give up. We cannot lose our principles. It, we just can't. It's very, very important. Um, in terms of, of the how, how our generation failed, I would... I'm surprised that you've heard that comment. I don't doubt it. But when I think about global development, the things that have happened that have gotten better in the period of my life. So since 1990, uh, we have gone from a billion people living on on or below a dollar twenty-five cents a day to about 750,000 living at or below a dollar fifty to two dollars. Now that's not a great thing in and of itself and hard to get your head around, but the reality is that that while population has increased, the raw numbers of people living in extreme poverty have also decreased. Um, I think about about how the role of women has changed 
in my own lifetime. I think about the fact that uh, in Mississippi, where I started my professional life, there are more black elected officials in the state of Mississippi than there are in any, any state in the country. And that is due, I give a lot of credit for that work to a former governor, not the one I talked about earlier, who's a friend of mine, who was very active in disrupting a political patronage system of how people were elected to office. His name is Ray Mabus, and he's now the Secretary of the Navy. Um, and an advocate for women being full-fledged Marines. So I actually feel like things are getting better, but there's lots of work to do. Uh, no, I'll use this one. Thanks. So I'm going to address two points. Um, first, the question about sort of inclusion and bringing people in, because um, it also, I think, addresses some of the issues raised by Laura and Tamara, because I, I work for a, a big conservation organization. We have over a million members in the United States. Um, typical age of our member, a member decided is defined as someone who writes us a check. Um, we've got over a million in the United States. The average age is 62, predominantly white. Pretty good gender balance, but you get the picture. Now think about the demographics of the country. We don't look like America, and we're getting old. So we've got a whole series of programs to try and address that. Um, and how do we part of, it started off as a conversation, well, gee, how do we perpetuate our fundraising base? And how do we perpetuate the next generation of conservation leaders and people who are going to vote for conservation policies? But it turned into a recognition it's not about bringing people to where we are. It's about understanding who's already there. So demographically, the community with the highest percentage or the that has the highest percentage of people who visit national and state parks are Latinos and it's viewed as quality family time together so like why would you go out and try and convince people to care about conservation when in fact they already associate national parks with quality family time we just have to figure do a much better job of figuring out how we reach out to them to connect with them where they are because they're already where we would want them to be to support our mission um, you know, I once sat in a room with a political consultant and a bunch of policy people like myself, who, not surprisingly, look kind of like me and Tom. Um, <laughs> and they asked three questions. How many of you read a newspaper every day, either online or, or on print? And almost every one of us policy people raised our hands. How many of you listen to NPR? Pretty much all of us raised our hands. And the next one, how many of you think it's normal to spend $4 on a cup of coffee? Pretty much everyone raised their hands. And then the consultant said, you represent less than 5% of America. What makes you think you know how to talk to America? So we had some work to do. So, but we've actually gotten much better at sort of the focus group workshopping and trying to bring in folks into the organization to help us understand how to do that. So we're on a journey, but we're definitely not there yet. The second point I want to address real qu quickly is, is um, Roger Mark's question, what did I wish I knew then? that I know now. And that's the difference between how to collective ownership of an idea versus individual ownership of an idea. Uh, my academic background did not serve me well in that regard. I came out of a pretty rigorous academic program. I have a PhD. I was educated by Jesuits. The idea was prove you're the smartest guy in the room. And yes, guy, because they were Jesuits. And it was a pretty gendered interaction style, to be frank. Right, about proving you have the best idea that can be defended against anybody else to prove that how smart you are. That, that works well in academic circles where it's about individual ownership and you get recognition by how, by how many papers you publish and how many other people cite your ideas in those publications. It doesn't work well in public service or large organizations, right? Because what succeeds there is generating collective ownership of your idea, which means you have to let it go. And more importantly, you have to let other people build on it or add to it, or you add to other people's ideas so that there is a sense of collective ownership. But what's really fascinating is that if you go to business school and study this stuff, they'll tell you that the group generally generates better ideas that have more traction and, more diver and that more diverse groups tend to lead to outcomes with more stable and enduring outcomes. And you get there through collective ownership, not by asserting that you're the only guy with the right answer. Yes. Yeah, oh, I just think, and also another really hopeful trend is, you know, at Peace Corps we have, we're, we received twenty thousand applications last year for five thousand positions. So, and when we look globally, we have about that many countries asking for volunteers, based on our estimates of how many they they would take if we could send them. And that's just Peace Corps, and that's just international. So, 
I think there's a huge appetite to um, volunteer. And I think we're finding that in the, in the U.S. too, where these efforts to look at gap year and look at education differently, think about service as that opportunity to even get school credit for it and combine it more, integrate it more with uh, curriculum. At Peace Corps, what we're doing is trying to remove barrier, barriers on the front end and in the back end um, that might keep, keep people from applying, from ever putting that application in the mailbox, which I get stopped pretty much once every six months still saying, oh, I almost applied for Peace Corps. I was in line at the post office. This is the funniest, interesting <laughs> experience once you're a Peace Corps volunteer. For whatever reason, people feel compelled to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, at the front end, it's just what, you know, opportunities to complete your master's degree while you're doing service and get academic credit, to come back, um, be able to defer your entry, be able to get um, free credit. Um, talking, we have an initiative with the Corporation for National Community Service that we're trying to really educate employers across sectors about the skills that are coming out of um, people who volunteer for a year of service or for two years in Peace Corps and what they're bringing back. And yes, a lot of them come back and do international development or education, but more and more we're creating pathways into the private sector and technology and people want those soft skills on their teams. Um, so I think that's really, that's really exciting. Um, I think in terms of how important, what's some things that are so important is that I've found is, and I wish I had, I'd, I try to pay attention to it, but at, at Kaboom, the playground was, was the idea of creating a, an achievable win. It, we focus in on local communities who don't have access to safe places to play. And in a way, at the beginning, it was, playground was just an excuse. It wasn't really about, it was about play, but it was about bringing people together. And I think by defining achievable wins, and I think it comes at, at Peace Corps, it, it comes at every place I've worked, it's um, recognizing, well, setting those achievable wins, recognizing them, and then be able to maintain that community around them. I would even call a great fellows program <laughs> part of that. Like, you go through this shared experience, stick together, because those are the people that you continue to come back to. Those are the people that supported you, who understand that the, the struggle. Um, it's also why we have such a, Peace Corps has a really strong return Peace Corps volunteer network. Um, I've had gotten a couple of jobs that way. <laughs> and not just in the employment front, but people get together years after they volunteered all over the country. So anyway, put that out there. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I'm going to work my way backward through the mm. questions because I really liked, Andrea, I really liked your comments on diversity and inclusion. Um, I think one of the things that I would wish, because Tom stole mine, <laughs> about taking the long view, which is very Senator Jackson principle as well, mm. Um, one of the things that I wish uh, current uh, executives and leaders would do more of is uh, create advancement opportunities and promotional opportunities for people that don't look like you and that don't have a similar background to you. Um, I think we have, uh, we have the conversation about diversity and inclusion often focuses on equity rather than on good business sense. And it's interesting because studies that are coming out now are saying that, you know, boards with women on them are making smarter investment decisions or smarter merger or acquisition decisions and having better successful implementation of those. And the same is true with, um, with ethnic diversity on boards and on teams. So I think that's, it's really wonderful to hear that that's become a value um, at the Nature Conservancy as well. So I would say the, the request that I would make is to find, uh, find people or individuals on your teams that don't look like you, that you can sponsor and find opportunities for them to take leadership roles, projects that they can lead, um, opportunities for advancement, and uh, opportunities to put their, their name in the uh, throw their hat in the ring for promotions and leadership opportunities as well. Um, I, uh, to the three questions that we had from the audience, Crosscut really prides itself on being a place where we can experiment and play with new ideas. Um, the the uh, journalism training we did on Saturday is an example of that. One of the other things that we tried this last year was a program called Civic Ambassadors, um, which was we were realizing that we, because we didn't yet have a diverse newsroom, we needed to bring people in to advise us on the coverage we were doing because we were missing things. You know, Craig was talking at the beginning about telling the stories. Um, we really focus on telling the stories that need to be told. Right now, especially in Seattle, we have a lot of stories that are slipping through the cracks just because our newsrooms aren't able to effectively cover everything. And all the newsrooms are stretched very thin financially, so trying to invest in the stories that will pack a punch. So for us, um, 
that experimentation is really important uh, in figuring out ways to tell those stories better. So the Civic Ambassador Program uh, invited 10 civic leaders um, from different communities that we didn't have represented in our newsroom um, to infuse ideas in. And, uh, and it was a test and it ended up being something that we are not going to continue doing. We sunsetted, but something that came out of it were these two young women who said, uh, you know, our biggest complaint with this program is that you're not asking enough of us. We want you to expect more from us. We want to be more involved. We want to do more. So they ended up crafting a young professionals board, which is actually going to be launching tomorrow morning on crosscut.com. So, uh, so for those in Seattle, check it out. Um, but that's an opportunity that we're, uh, that we're going to be launching and is, is, as far as we can tell, something that uh, no other nonprofit newsrooms are doing um, and uh, is, a, is a really cool way for us to actually build some of that leadership um, in young professionals um, from uh, diverse ethnic communities to infuse their ideas into our publication. Um, Matthew, what story would I tell to inspire others into public service? Um, my first response, though, was uh, read ta Coates' Between the World and Me. That was, uh, I feel like that book took the choice out of it for me. It, it's no longer an element of um, do I choose public service over for profit, um, but how do I integrate my passions into serving the needs of the world because it's not a choice for the majority of people. And I think until it is a choice, we really can't think about public service as being something that people opt into. It should be how do you serve the public through whatever role you have. Um, there's some really interesting things happening with B Corps and with for-profits that have community investment wings um, in the, as part of their business plan. And I say, so I think there's, there's ways within any industry or any role that people can be a part of public service. Um, and I think this ties into the conversation about you know, it moving from a government thing to a kind of nonprofit uh, or service volunteerism into how do we actually live out the triple bottom line in all elements of industry, business, public, private, anything. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I guess, um, I guess, I, did I hit all the questions? I think so. <laughs> Great. So Thank you. Thank you. Laura? So I will um, just focus on the something to do better question that you asked, Raja Mark, and I think, well, what immediately comes to mind for me is I wish that generations before us had been more comfortable with being uncomfortable mm. because the conversations that are important and the conversations that are relevant are the least comfortable conversations to have but that that aversion to risk and that aversion to discomfort has put us in a very precarious situation so you know whether it's and this is not you know explicitly in terms of uh, inequality or race related issues but even when we're thinking about um when we're thinking about climate change, when we're thinking about consumption, when we're thinking about energy use, energy efficiency, it is often because we have an aversion to having uncomfortable conversations, um, you know, that we that we land up in these instances. So I hope that what we can do, um, which is possibly you, the fellows and I, well, us fellows, the, the Jackson fellows were speaking briefly about this before we came on here, but... Uh, hopefully what we can do um, in, in our generation is, is to breach those uncomfortable discussions, to really dig deep and to go into that, you know, uncomfortable, uncharted territory and have those conversations in a way that is inclusive. I think what was mentioned on the panel is, you know, the more diversity of thought that you bring to a situation or to, a, to an issue is the more sustainable that the solution will be. Mm -hmm. So I hope that we pick up the baton where... Um, where past generations have have left it and, and really go to those um, uncomfortable places as, as exhausting as it often as it can become uh, to go there. What story would you tell? Yikes. <laughs> um, I oh wow I re yeah I didn't choose this work. Um, <laughs> my mom forced me. <laughs> 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 My mom forced me to do this. That's why I'm here. But um, <laughs> really, really, but you really, she with did. a smile. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's because this is being recorded, and I'm, <laughs> I know she she might be watching it from South Africa. So, um, uh, but in all seriousness, so b both of my parents are in public service. My father works in um, the Ministry of Economic Planning and Development in Swaziland. My mom is a public interest environmental attorney. So. I grew up, you know, with these issues, um, certainly from my mom's side. Um, she now works on, or she co 
co she's the co-founding director for the Swaziland Environmental Law Center. So we co-founded that center together after she won the Goldman um, Prize in 2010. So growing up in a household with somebody who has those values of public interest, environmental law, of human rights, of you know advocating for the interests of disenfranchised communities, I just I really had no choice. I actually remember growing up, and this will be my story then, Tamara. I remember growing up, my mom had this laptop, and uh, my mom was always gone for work, and rarely available for, for a lot of things that other kids' parents were available for. But what is burned into my memory is when she was at home and she was working on her laptop, she had this um, sticker on it that said, I stand for the rights of indigenous people. And I thought, wow, that is really cool that you can stand for the rights of people who are otherwise disenfranchised. Um, and so that's, that's, that's really it for me is, um, you know, and, and I think we've spoken about this in the fellowship program as well, but coming into a room with a sense of confidence and a sense of passion that says the issues that I'm discussing, the issues that I stand for are not just my issues, they're the issues of a plethora of people, of a legion of people that I represent so many people just sitting here by myself. I represent the issues and interests of millions of people. Such an empowering thing, and I think that's what has really led me to stay in public service or led me to stay in advocacy and justice work. Um, and my mom. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Wow. That was a um, re really powerful set of answers. So I think we've had a, a really important uh, dialogue today. And I, I think for me, we started our conversation thinking about this context of leadership and public service. What do we mean by leadership? What do we mean by public service? How, how come we've gone from this point of when you were really very capable and excelled, you aspired to public service um, and what that means now and how we're able to transform this sense of what it means to be engaged in public service? And, and how is that tied to questions around values? We talked about principles, we talked about integrity, respect, respect, diligence, public interest, and how all of these came together. So there's a little bit of the contextualization for us of these questions around leadership, public service, and values. The, the second area of the discussion for me, I think, is what, what's important? What's important in this space? We talked about vocation, recognizing that once you get to that space where it's easy for you to do those things, that you're coming from a position of passion, vocation, and authenticity that drives you. Service hooked me, and it just never let go, right? Such a, a powerful, compelling place. And what that meant in terms of looking at perceptions moving beyond tokenism, we talked about moving beyond stereotypes, what it meant for storytelling and representation and a collective voice, collective ownership, collective um, uh, coming together to generate ideas and how do you build relationships and the soft skills that are important for building relationships. So the centrality of those set of ideas in terms of what it means to have a, a career in public service and to be a leader in public service. And then the final set of issues for me that we discussed is, well, how, how, do, you, how do you move forward? What's the way forward? And we talked about recognizing the importance of um, surrounding yourselves with folks who have these ideas. And, and some of us talked about this as serendipity. Some of us talked about it as having a mom who pushed us in that direction. But, but some of us said it was, you know, I'm in an international negotiating context, and there's a human moment about trying to do the right thing. You can't program that. You can't plan that. But once you're on this journey, you experience those moments that propel you forward. It met me where I was at the right time. Bam! You're in. 
Okay, so just sort of recognizing that that's part of being comfortable with the uncomfortable. It's not just the questions that we ask, but recognizing the journey in public service is not always linear. There are things that you, you sort of set yourself on that path, but you get there. And that creates the opportunities. And I think the hope, we talked about the degree that we are seeing more and more Americans wanting to volunteer volunteer, applying for these positions with interaction, the importance of staying close to the work about defining achievable wins. And I think even to, to, to go back to Kaboom, you said for the playground, it was about bringing people together. For me, and forgive me, I'm from the Caribbean, it's about having fun. <laughs> you know, it's once you get to this space and you're driven by your passions, you are so enjoy public service that you can't help but do it. It. You're driven by it. And I, I will take you back. You know, Lindsay said that she has two teenage daughters that hold her accountable. I have two sons who are 19 and 21 now. But about 10 years ago, I was walking my eight year old son to the bus stop. And he looked up at me. I had just started a new position. I was very excited about it. And he looked up at me and he said, Dad, are you happier now? when you're on the brink of this new job and this new opportunity? Or, or were you happier when you just came out of grad school? I'm like, how old are you? <laughs> <laughs> but I just thought he, and he was asking, he was eight years old, but he was saying, when you were on the brink of feeling that you could make a difference and wanted to commit to doing things, were you happier then? Or are you happier now that you've been doing this work for 20 something years? And for me, what we need to, to, to do is capture the kernel of that idea. How do we maintain that hope, that enthusiasm, that we, we, are, we were asked about how do you remain principled? How do you remain in that space of authenticity? And to me, that is leadership in this public service space. How do we find that? capture it, um, harness it, do it through mentoring and uh, mentoring others. So this is a wonderful conversation today. A huge thanks to the um, Jackson Foundation, to the fellows who are on the panel with us. And I was particularly pleased to have our colleagues from Interaction who's doing this relationship building through a large coalition, through TNC, a really large, prominent environmental organization and through the Peace Corps, who's really about service and volunteering and more. I think it was a really excellent discussion for me today. I hope you come away enthusiastic and excited and are looking forward to our reception for additional networking. But please join me in thanking Craig, Carol, and Laura from the Jackson Foundation and our panelists today, Ted, Tom, Lindsay, and Andrew, Tamara, and Laura. Thank you. And please stay and network further. My colleagues will direct you to our, our reception. Um, and let's, let's uh, continue to get to know each other more. Thanks. We should catch up. I would, because as we're cooking up ideas of what we're like, what we think of foreign assistance agenda is,